Today is the very last day of the year 2023. Now, some may be experiencing some degree of relief that the year is finally over, while others may be anticipating tough times ahead and are looking at the beginning of the new year uh, with some degree of trepidation. Well, in reality, tomorrow is only one day later than today. We ascribe some kind of symbolic transformation as we pass from one year to the next. This is the time when we typically decide what things in our lives we want to change, what, what things we will prioritize during our planet's next trip around the sun. And while I didn't select my text for this morning in an attempt to preach a quote-unquote New Year's message, I think uh, there are some things here that are suitable for this occasion. So if you would, please turn with me to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 13, the Gospel of Matthew chapter 13. That should be on page 819 of the Bibles that are in the pew racks there in front of you. Please feel free to use one of those. And throughout this chapter that we've been going through over the last number of weeks, uh, so far we have uh, looked at six parables that Jesus taught. Uh, these are the parable of the sower, the parable of the wheat and the weeds, the mustard seed, the parable of the leaven, the parable of the hidden treasure, and also the related parable of the pearl of great value. The first four of these parables were taught by Jesus to the crowd, with Jesus explaining at least two of them, two we find in the text, uh, explaining these two uh, to His disciples a bit later. The last two that we looked at, it seems that Jesus taught to His disciples alone. And this morning, as we consider the final two parables that Jesus teaches in this chapter, uh, these also are not taught to the crowds, but also just to His disciples. And these parables seem, at least to me, to be a call to action, a call to action for the followers of Jesus Christ. So let's dive into the text together. Please stand with me in honor of the reading of God's Word. We'll be reading Matthew chapter 13, starting in verse 47 and reading through to verse 52. The Word of God says this, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw away the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understood all these things? They said to him, yes. And he said to them, therefore every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. You may be seated. Father, I just come before you right now as we uh, just consider this text that we have before us. I pray, Lord, that you would be glorified in its proclamation. We pray, Lord, that your word would go forth clearly, and we pray that we would respond. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, uh, as we kind of go back to our text, um, I want to bring out three things that we can see from this passage that I just read a few moments ago. And the first thing is that what Jesus is doing here is He's reinforcing previous teaching. He's reinforcing previous teaching teaching. You may have noticed as I read through the passage again a few moments ago that the parable of the dragnet is, is quite similar to the parable of the wheat and the weeds. Uh, that parable, the wheat and the weeds, was intended to teach that good and evil were going to exist together until the end. Again, remember that we can't, as we look at those parables, we can't equate the kingdom with the church. The parable is not, we talked about it at the time, is not teaching that there will always be false believers in the church. That may be a true statement, but it isn't what the parable is teaching. Again, the Jews were awaiting the coming of their Messiah, uh, with, with the, 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 their Messiah who they thought would, would come in a similar way to the judges 
of the past, back from the book of Judges. They expected him to come in and rescue them from Israel's oppressors, which at that time would have been the Romans. And they expected that he would restore the kingdom of Israel as in the days of David. Uh, They expected that when the Messiah revealed himself, he was going to take swift action to wipe out their enemies and to bring peace to his people. They didn't understand that the Messiah's mission went so far beyond what they expected and would unfold quite differently. The parable of the wheat and the weeds teaches that good and evil will continue to coexist in the kingdom of the Messiah until the end of the age. The field which contains both the wheat and the weeds, as stated in verse 38, is the world. And what does the kingdom of the Messiah consist of? Well, uh, what does Jesus say as he gives the great commission just before he ascends into heaven? In Matthew 28, 18, Jesus says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So again, the kingdom of the Messiah goes far beyond Israel. It extends to the entire earth and even beyond the earth to heaven itself. So within that kingdom, the place where Jesus has authority, evil will continue to exist until the end of the age. There are different ways that we can divide up history. We can look at the old covenant versus the new covenant. We can uh, look at uh, pre-fall versus post-fall. We can talk about tribulation periods and millenniums. But the most basic division that we find in Scripture, certainly in the New Testament, is the division between the present evil age and the age to come. And the age to come is when all sin is fully and finally dealt with. And we, as the people of God, will live in perfect peace and unity with our Creator and Redeemer. One of the greatest passages in all of Scripture has got to be the last two chapters of the book of Revelation. The description of the age to come there is breathtaking. And I'm not even talking about the streets of gold that are somehow also like transparent glass. I mean, that sounds amazing, don't get me wrong, but I I can't even wrap my brain about what that would look like. But I'm talking about things like chapter 21, verse 4, where it says that death shall be no more. Many of you know that my wife's brother, Tony, went to be with the Lord this past Friday. And Adrian, Adrian Phillips' sister, Donna, passed a couple of weeks ago, as did Pat Harris, who used to attend here and whose funeral we celebrated last Uh, last week. But to come to a time when that doesn't happen anymore, to come to a time when we don't have events like we just had here in the service, where ailment strikes somebody in a moment's notice, to come to a place where all of that goes away, when you no longer have to worry about getting those late night phone calls, that's a glorious, wonderful expectation. Or verse 25, where it says, speaking of the new Jerusalem, its gates will never be shut by day and there will be no night there. It's a picture of perfect peace and safety. And while that will be glorious, that time is not yet. And this is really Jesus' point in that parable of the wheat and the weeds. And it's also the point of the parable here that we are calling the parable of the dragnet. Look with me starting in verse 47. Jesus says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw away the bad. So again, just like the wheat and the weeds are growing together in the field, both good fish and bad fish are living together in the lake. Now, some people have pressed the imagery of this parable too far and tried to to make the casting of the net referring to evangelism. And just like as often happens with the parable of the wheat and the weeds, they try to make this about the church. As if it's about bringing all kinds of people in and letting God sort them out later. But again, that goes against other scriptures that are about the church. Uh, Speaking of church discipline, for example, and the purity of the church. And just like with the wheat and the weeds, we need to read what Jesus actually says and also take note of what he doesn't say. In his interpretation, he doesn't say anything about evangelism or anything about the church. His point is the separation of the good fish from the bad fish, and that will happen when the net is full. 
This is the same as in the parable of the wheat and the weeds, the separation of the two in that parable happening at harvest time, the end of the age. Jesus makes that very clear in his explanation of both of these parables. So why would Jesus teach two very similar parables seemingly so close together? I think probably a couple of reasons. First of all, I think we can agree that repetition can help people remember. That's how we memorize things. We re- re- go over them over and over. So certainly teaching this same idea again can help people to remember. But repetition also in Scripture shows emphasis. He's obviously trying to make the point that this is important. He wants to drill this truth into the disciples' heads. But although this parable does have the same essential meaning as uh, the parable of the wheat and the weeds, there is a bit of a difference. And I mean beyond just the change of metaphors from the field to the lake. The previous parable tells us of the final destiny of the wheat as well as the weeds. Well, in this one, Jesus focuses only on the punishment of the wicked. And that's the second point in your study notes there if you're following along. Jesus focuses on the punishment of the wicked. Jesus, after presenting this, uh, the parable in, in, in verses 47 and 48, he immediately, he doesn't wait for anyone to ask a question. He doesn't wait for any time to pass. Immediately he gives the interpretation. The parable referred to uh, by the gathered fish being uh, separated with the good fish being put into containers and the bad fish being thrown away. And Jesus goes on to explain what all this means. He said, so it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous. Again, just like the other parable, the gatherers here are the angels, and they're given the assignment of separating the bad fish from the good, separating the evil from the righteous. And then in Verse 50, the parable goes beyond just having the same meaning as the parable of the weeds. It ends up repeating verse 42, word for word. The angels are to then throw the evil into the fiery furnace. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, Jesus shared this parable with only his disciples, those who we would think would be identified with the righteous in this parable. They are, outside of Judas anyway, good fish. They're the ones who have received the scattered seed, the words of Jesus on good soil, and that has taken root and grown, and they have begun to bear fruit. They're the ones who have ears to hear and have given up everything for the kingdom. So why does Jesus repeat this message to these people, Judas notwithstanding. Well, again, Jesus has just pointed out to his disciples with two simple and very similar parables to one another, the inestimable value of the kingdom. And now he's driving home not just how valuable the kingdom is, but the stakes that are involved. Because let's face it, it's one thing to say that the kingdom is of great value, but it's quite another to understand the serious consequences of not gaining entrance entrance into it. Let me give you a simple example. Uh, Two weeks ago, when we did look at those parables of uh, the treasure and the pearl, we talked about the fact that sometimes we see things that we think simply we must have. We see an item for sale at a store or maybe up on eBay or or Amazon or something, and and let's say it's a particularly hard-to-find item. Maybe it's something that's been discontinued or it's a limited edition or something you've been collecting. And, And this may be your only opportunity to obtain that item. And you think, man, I need to take advantage of this while I can. And even though if it's an item that is costly, uh, there will be some sacrifice involved, it is worth it more to you to have that item than it is to give up uh, what you'll be spending, what you'll be giving them to obtain that item. And you feel like you just can't miss out on this deal. But let's face it, even if you've had a situation like that, Even if you uh, do miss out on that deal, what is the actual consequence? When it really comes down to it, what is the consequence you're dealing with? You've lived this long without owning that particular widget or whatever it may be. What is the real consequence if you miss out? 
But coming back to the parable of the pearl for a moment, let's say instead of a pearl, the thing that this merchant was looking for was an extremely rare plant that ended up being the only cure for a fatal disease that he had contracted. Now it's not only a desire to obtain this item, but it is now a matter of life and death. This man literally must have it. Jesus is reinforcing to his disciples the true value of the kingdom. To not obtain this treasure has eternal consequences. And it's important for us to be as clear as we can be as to what those consequences are. However, these days, many preachers tend to shy away from talking about such things. And I believe this is a serious Serious mistake. And it leads people to taking sin much less seriously than we should. Jesus clearly thought it was important. He spoke of the final judgment of unbelievers more than anyone else in all of Scripture. Now here he uses the term fiery furnace, which clearly is meant to make us think back to the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the book of Daniel. And interestingly, King Nebuchadnezzar uh, had these faithful Uh, Jews thrown into a fiery furnace because they refused to bow down to an idol. Yet they were protected from this judgment. They were protected by one who was like a son of the gods as Nebuchadnezzar described him in Daniel chapter 3 verse 25. And it's the very son of God who keeps us as believers safe from God's impending judgment against sin. He suffered the wrath of his father on behalf of all sinners who would come to him in repentance and faith. This is the gift of the gospel. This is why Jesus came. The Jews were looking for freedom from the Romans. Jesus provided freedom from the true enemies of sin and death. You know, as I was reflecting, and I've shared this with a few people, as I was reflecting on my brother-in-law's death from just a couple of days ago at the age of 54, um, I was reflecting on the fact that, you know, when we experience the death of people who have, have lived a full life, they're in their 90s, and they've lived a full life, and they've lived a relatively healthy life, and then, you know, they, they just pass away. It's just their time. It's so easy for us to to get this idea in our mind that death is just a natural part of life. But we need to realize that, that death is an enemy. Death is the last enemy. Death has been conquered by Christ and because of him, through him, the sting of death can be eliminated. Now, I'm feeling the loss of my brother in law It hasn't even fully hit me yet. I know my wife is mourning incredibly. From our perspective, he went far too soon. But recognizing that we know that he is now with the Savior takes so much of that sting away. But but recognizing that, uh, that, that Jesus provided that relief from the sting of death, he has given true freedom. But not all embrace that incredible gift that Christ has purchased for us. And so judgment will still come. Jesus here and in several other places uses fire metaphors to describe the ultimate fate of the wicked. But as we've said before, people people so often push metaphors farther than they're intended uh, to be taken. They hypothesize that if the wicked are thrown into a fiery furnace, then it uh, it must mean that they're burned up and then just cease to exist. But we need to recognize that this terminology of fire is not the only terminology that's used to describe these things. Jesus three times in the Gospel of Matthew refers to the place of final judgment as outer darkness. And we can see that people who are there in that outer darkness are conscious and and know what's going on. Consider Jesus' statements in Luke chapter 13 verses 24 to 28. He says, strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able 
When once the master of the house has risen and shut the door and you begin to stand outside and to knock at the door saying, Lord, open to us, then he will answer you, I do not know where you come from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. When you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves cast out. Six times in the Gospels, Jesus uses the term weeping and gnashing of teeth to describe the activity in that place of eternal punishment. Whether he refers to it as outer darkness or the fiery furnace, he uses that same term. And we all know what weeping is, right? Every one of us has had bouts of weeping in our lives over something. But what is the gnashing of teeth? Well, it's when someone grinds their teeth together, clenching their jaw in either rage or pain or both. If you've ever seen any movies where you know, typically they're movies from the past uh, when someone has to have surgery uh, without the benefit of anesthesia. And, and they'll generally put a piece of leather or something similar in between the person's teeth that for them to bite down on when the pain hits. And, and this is to stop them from potentially biting their tongue or severely damaging their teeth because that, that initial reaction to the pain is to just clamp down. People also tend to do this when, whether, uh, when they're in a fit of rage. We talk about gritting our teeth to try to control our anger. And this is the reaction of the wicked when they're cast into this place of punishment. And, and again, we, much like the streets of gold with, that are transparent like glass, we, we can't wrap our brains around a place that is both dark and fiery. We, we can't wrap our brains around the metaphors that are used to describe uh, the, 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 the wrath and the place of punishment that awaits the wicked, those who ha- are not found to be in Christ. But what we do know is it is not a pleasant place to be. This is something that at all costs we want to avoid. Now you may say, all right, pastor, what are you trying to do? You're trying to scare me? Well, well no more so than Jesus was. But if you're still in your sin, if you haven't put your trust in Jesus Christ, that according to Romans chapter 2 and verse 5, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. And that should concern you. For those of us who are believers, we should seek to understand these things not only for ourselves, but also for the sake of others. Because the fact remains that Jesus wants us to share what we've learned. That's the third point in your study notes. Jesus wants us to share what we have learned. Look at me at verse uh, verse 51. Jesus asks uh, asks the question of his disciples, have you understood all these things? And by all these things, Jesus is referring to all that he has taught in the seven parables that he's presented so far in this chapter those that he explained as well as those he did not. He's asking if they understand the surprising way that the kingdom comes. Do they grasp its supreme value? Do they understand the small beginnings and the magnificent conclusion? And and their answer to him seemingly without any hesitation is yes. Now, I don't know how enthusiastically that reply was given. I'm sure it was well-meaning, and and, uh, but uh, it may not have been completely accurate. They may have thought they understood, but it will become obvious that they didn't fully understand as we continue on in the coming weeks. Again, this is not to say that they were lying by any stretch. They they certainly understood more than the crowds did, but we also will find that in a couple of chapters, they will be rebuked by Jesus for their dullness and their lack of understanding. So they don't understand as much as they think they do. But Jesus here doesn't challenge their response. Instead, he charges them to use what they know, what they have learned, what they understand for the benefit of others. Again, look with me at verse 52, where Jesus shares another parable. He he says, Therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of a house who brings out of his treasure what is new and what is old. 
The treasure that Jesus is talking about here is God's word. And I hope that you think of God's word that way as well, that, that it is a treasure beyond compare. Now, the scribes, as were mentioned here, were experts in God's word. In the Old Testament, Ezra was a scribe. It says of Ezra in Ezra 7.10, <coughs> excuse me, it says, Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to do it and to teach his statutes and rules in Israel. The scribes not only made copies of the scriptures, and they did that, uh, but they also interpreted the scriptures. They also taught the scriptures. But Jesus here is not talking about an ordinary scribe, but a scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven. The scribes were experts in the law, but most of them set themselves up against Jesus because they did not understand nor embrace the teaching of the kingdom that he brought. However, the disciples, in contrast, have said that they do understand what Jesus has been teaching about the kingdom through these parables. And so to the extent that they understand, they, like scribes, are to put that knowledge to use. They're to bring out of their treasure what is, as Jesus says, what is new and what is old. This is not to suggest that there are new things that we simply tack on to the teaching that had been given already. Again, there is one true gospel, there is one true revelation, and the, the quote-unquote new teaching that Jesus is bringing to the disciples is nothing more than the complete fulfillment of the old. The Old Testament promises of the Messiah and the kingdom and the law as well all find their fulfillment in the person, the teaching, and the work of Jesus. And so the disciples are to be like the scribes, teaching, passing on what they have learned to others. And believers today have the same essential mission. We who have ears to hear, we who have received the scattered seed on good soil, we who have been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, we haven't been given these things for our benefit alone. But as we go about our lives, we're to be seeking to make more disciples. To the best of our ability, we need to know the word of God that has been entrusted to us. And then we need to share it with others. There are many different ways to do this, but we all need to be involved. For you kids who are here, you can share with your friends what you've learned in Sunday school or in Olympians. If you have younger brothers or sisters, you can pass on what you've learned to them also. For all of us, if God has, uh, in his incredible mercy, has saved us, if you are a believer, then you are to pass on what you have learned, what God has revealed to you. There are many others who have not yet repented. There are many others who have not yet put their trust in Christ and there is a day of judgment coming. Who will warn them? As Jesus went about his earthly ministry, he didn't hold back one bit. He focused on what was important. He called people to repentance, and he warned them of the wrath that was to come. We love to quote John 3.16, and with good reason. It's an incredible truth in the Bible. But we should also keep John 3.36 in mind. It says, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. We're to be like scribes that have been trained for the kingdom of heaven, and we need to be faithful to pass on what we have learned. We need to preach the good news but the good news doesn't have the same effect if we water down or avoid the bad news. As believers who've been regenerated and indwelt by the Holy Spirit, we've been blessed to see and understand things that others do not left to themselves. And, and I want you to ask yourself, do you appreciate this great treasure that we have been given? And, and do you appreciate it enough to pass on that incredible treasure? 
to share that treasure with others. These final parables here in Matthew chapter 13, I believe, are a call to action. There is a judgment day coming, and people need to be prepared for it because there are eternal consequences. And if you are here today, if you are here in this congregation, we know we are not guaranteed tomorrow. We know that at a moment's notice, our health and our life could be taken from us. No one is guaranteed our next breath. So let's make today the day of salvation. If you are here today and you've not put your trust in Christ, turn from your sin, repent, trust in him now. Call out to God and say, God, I'm a sinner. I have broken your law. I understand that. And I realize that that by your standard, which is perfection, there's no possible way I could make it to heaven. But what a great God. You have made a way by sending your son who lived a perfect life, who fulfilled the law of God that we could never do, You sent him to pay the penalty for my sin. So that on the cross, he suffered the wrath of God that we deserved. So that by trusting in him, I can be made righteous. I can be declared to to be not guilty. That I can be made right with God. And that is true. If you will call on the name of the Lord, call on him to save you. Put your trust in him, depending on him and what Christ did on the cross, you will be saved. You don't have to fear that judgment that's coming. The wrath of God will be propitiated, turned away from you. And you can have eternity with Christ in heaven. You can walk in truth and righteousness. And if anyone would want to talk about their relationship with Christ here this morning, I will be right down here as we sing our final song. You can come right down to the front. I would love nothing more than to talk about about it with you to show you how, from the Scriptures, you can be right with God, how you can be... um, forgiven of your sin, and that you can have eternity with him in heaven. Let's pray together. Father, I just thank you so much for this day. Uh, this, this service itself has shown us that we, we don't know what will come. Uh, we don't know what you have for us in these next moments. But we do know that, that Christ has paid the price for us. We do know there is a day of judgment coming. We need to be made right with you. And Lord, through the blood of Christ, that is possible. And I pray, Lord, if there's anyone here within the sound of my voice that does not know you, you draw them to yourself even now. We just thank you and we praise you. Help us, Lord, to be faithful, to share what we know, to share what we've been learned, like like scribes, that we would take it and share it with others, that we would teach your word to the best of our ability to those who we come in contact with, that we would share the hope that we have within us. We just praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.